Hello everyone, I'm finally back with a new video. So there's like a lot of things to share, but today I wanted to share with you something about the ROG Spectrum Analyzers. And if you're looking about a compact, but also a cheap Spectrum Analyzer, there's like no doubt that this one will actually please you. I will also be able to compare it with the Spectrum V6 that you can see in here, and also the BB60D. So like that, you may also find the pros and cons of this device, and that will also maybe help you to do your choice at the end. All right, let's go. Let's see about the size. So as a first SA, I got the uh, QC900A. That's probably one of my best uh, spectralizer that I can bring outside. Very sensitive, but but it's limited in bandwidth. So I wanted also to try the Spectrum V6, which has a better bandwidth. I was interested about the X2000 version, which allows you possible to have like a two. Uh, 245 megahertz the bandwidth which is interesting for me because i can spot in real time a larger bandwidth it comes also with a sweep speed which is clearly better than the uh, this sa because the uh, the sweep speed is one terahertz per second but at the end the spectrum v6 is less sensitive because also uh, you will see we cannot set up it with a lesser bandwidth than for for this version 96 megahertz or 95 megahertz so as I wanted also something that is much more sensible, but also much more precise for the frequency I was using between 9 kilohertz and 6 gigahertz. I also, it's, uh, it should be mentioned that, for example, the Spectrum V6 cannot go precisely at 9 kilohertz. So as I wanted also to spot low frequency as well, uh, the only other option that I have are the, uh, I mean, this one, which can actually scan from uh, 100 kilohertz to 10 gigahertz, or this one is, yeah, 10.8 gigahertz, sorry. And this one is from 9 kilohertz to 6 gigahertz. But then I was interested about another type of essay. This one, which is, uh, if we just like do the comparison, for example, the Spectrum V6 is exactly pretty the same size as the QC900. Eight. The Signal Hound is a little bit smaller, and but still a little bit bigger than the Arrogic one in here. So as you can see, up, you have something that is very compact in there. I would probably just like put it in there so like that you can also see the comparison. So in terms of size, the Arrogic is actually, I mean, it's winning the game. Uh, but, but we'll see that we have pros and cons for everything. Okay, so now let's maybe take a look at a teardown in order to have an idea of the design also as well. I think the USB connection, data, data connection in here, you see the USB power, which is in there. So the power is also completely isolated from the data that is coming. And then inside, there should be the RF part because you see still this is the antenna inside in here. And so in there, I should actually see the RF front end and maybe somewhere else in there would be like maybe the processing of that. So here is the wall teardown of the device. So as you can see, there's like many parts. It is well isolated. I will not go through all the details in there because also Arrowgic wants to release the architecture by themselves, step by step. So uh, I can just like show you like a big picture and on the big picture, you can already see that, I mean, the air front end is in there. The RF antenna is in, in here. Uh, and so basically the signal will go through all the switches and the filters in order for us to filter the spurs, but also the harmonics that are unwanted. And also you have another step. So the two steps, I mean, the two cards that are connected together in here, Will be responsible for example to filter a little bit the signal but also do uh, the, the down conversion to if and then the signal will be, go through the this part which has an adc in there and then the adc will process the analogic signal to numeric signal so like that then the fpga can process it and then can forward the samples managed also by the computer so the computer will actually tell how much samples it needs and then the FPGA will actually forward it to the USB. But as you can see so far, 
it is well isolated. The work was actually, uh, I mean, well made. They could make the device as compact as it is by maybe separating also all the parts that way. But it gives also a proper isolation at some point, which is something that we don't encounter like, you know, in some uh, products. So if we try to compare also this architecture to the Spectrum V6, we can see that it's totally different. Uh, for example, we see already that the Spectrum V6 is using an SDR architecture by uh, taking an all-in-one chip that will actually do the job of doing the down conversion, the mixing, the ADC, and other stuff. Uh, I mean, everything is actually ending by this chip. So like that, it also makes uh, this device, I mean, it's, it should actually make this device much more compact, but at the end also a lot of work is required in order to avoid reflection, etc. So it's also complicated with this architecture to handle uh, all unwanted uh, spurs and un unwanted signal from reflection and so on. Um, um, and I remember that, for example, if you look at the forum of the QC908, you will see that they had a lot of pain to try to isolate things properly in order to avoid these kind of uh, problems. And to compare the BB60D uh, or C, which is from SignalHound, I also recommend you maybe to watch this show from TSP, which also gives you a nice uh, overview about uh, this kind of device. Uh, so I actually own the BB60D, so it's pretty close to the B uh, BB60C with some improvements, but uh, as far as, as you can see, it's act actually pretty the same. So it will also give you maybe another approach of what a real essay architecture should actually look on Super Dyne, right? So in this show, you can see the uh, act, which is also used by Signal Hound, and you can directly observe that also a lot of work have been also applied in order to uh, remove a lot of unwanted spurs and so on. You have also first converter, second converters there. I mean, there's like many uh, steps that are followed. But yeah, here it's very transparent with the signal hound and the uh, aerologic um, architecture that everything is actually well separated and also uh, pretty well made. And the aerologic looks pretty the same as the BB60D uh, that I own. Uh, maybe with some differences, I will not be able to actually tell about how well it is made compared to, uh, to, uh, to the others. The best way is probably just like to run some tests on that. In my point of view, it would be like better to actually do that uh, because on, in terms of architecture, I will not be able to tell you about this. Maybe someone who is actually, I mean, a designer will actually tell the, the problems that you, we may face with one or, or both. But in here, I can only tell you about the isolation and so on based on uh, other, uh, other experience, I mean, other feedbacks that I have, as both from TSP and other show, for example. So now let's take a look at the interfaces. As you can see in there, we have an RF antenna, RF in, which supports in here like 20 dBm maximum without amplificator and 10 dBm maximum with an amplificator. So it's better to not use more than 10 dBm at the end on the RF in. But as you can see, the RF in connector doesn't look like an SMA connector, but a 2.92 mm which is uh, mechanically compatible with SMA. So you can actually plug, uh, you know, SMA uh, antennas on that. But I mean, the use of this connector is to be used also on 20 gigahertz frequency. So that's also why we have this interface instead of the SMA, which is clearly used everywhere. Uh, so this is, I mean, this interface costs also much more money, uh, for example, if you want to look at the same connectors, for example. But still, we can use the same SMA connectors for frequency that are a little bit uh, lower than 20 gigahertz. Uh, let's say that, you know, uh, 16 or even uh, 15 gigahertz, lesser than that. But at uh, 20 gigahertz, you have to also maybe take in account that uh, then you have to use also other connectors and other antennas as well. In the back, you have uh, different interfaces. So exactly the same as uh, the Spectrum V6, but with just one data USB uh, in USB-C and a power connector. So, I mean, one connector should be connected to uh, the power supply and data to your computer. And there's like also an AUXEO, which allows you to extend a little bit the capabilities of the device by putting an external uh, GPS DO or even uh, extend the board in order for example to maybe synchronize a little bit with a switch, an error switch, especially if you have a different type of antenna that are much more tuned 
or for some frequency, for example. So, so it could be very handy to have that. So for the setup, I choose also to make this setup like that. So everything is connected to the same splitter like that. And it uses just one uh, source of reference. I mean, uh, one antenna. Oh yeah. Um, and it's true that today I would just like show you, for example, using the proper software, how, I mean, everything is displayed. So like that, you have also a raw ID. And then, I mean, I think that for another video, it would be better maybe to use a generator and also the raw IQ against another raw IQ to have like also a better idea of the sensitivity, uh, the dynamic range and so on. Uh, because I will not be able to be precise using the same software. Uh, because I mean, also the software can also fake a lot of things, right? So yeah, to be much more relevant, I think that another video would be like interesting to, to have on the raw IQ, so like that will be more precise using your generator. And so like that, uh, you know, uh, also using your generator, you will be also be able to, to see the different features we have uh, with the software. So now let us look at the SAS Studio 4 software like that. So we just like click on it, try to click on it. And now we are actually landed to the sweep mob mode. So the sweep mode is actually showing you what is going on between 9 kHz to 20 GHz, which is impressive. The Spectrum V6 that I have, which was like the most expensive one, is only able to go with some hacks at 8 GHz. But yeah, in this situation, we have a native uh, device, which is also not very expensive. Uh, that is less expensive than the BB60D, which has also a sweep speed, which is lower than that. Because if you look at the sweep speed, you can see that the sweep speed is at 428 GHz, which is impressive. And so you can see that for this range of frequencies, it is enough uh, for that. I will use the trace here because we have also some trace modules in there. So we can maybe just add the trace on maximum all like that. So you can spot some frequency that are happening there. And now I will use a remote in order to see if something is happening. So I will just like use a remote like uh, right now, like click, click, click. And as you can see, click is like a little a spike that is happening. I can maybe zoom on this spike in order to see what is going on. Up, and you see it's pretty reactive at the end. So as you can see, this full speed is enough for this range of frequency at the end. Um, still, the Spectrum V6 I have has like a one terahertz per second sweet speed, which is also very expressive. But also you have like the um, uh, the new version of the Spectrum V6, which has um, a three terahertz uh, per second sweet speed, but at the end four. I mean, 4 gigahertz per second is enough. If you're looking at the BB60D, and with the BB60D, unlike the SM version, we, which have the 1 terahertz uh, per second sweet speed, you have only 24 gigahertz, which is, you will see it's a little bit slow. But as you can see, I mean, for the higher logic, it's a good point that, I mean, we have a, a decent sweet speed, which allows us to spot a lot of things uh, very quickly. And when I said that the sweet speed uh, is 400, I mean, a little bit more than 400 gigahertz per second, this is true, unless you just disable the spur rejection. So if you're going to the right column in there, you can see a spur rejection feature that you can disable. You can also press enhance. So like that, you can see also that the speed just dropped by two. And then normally this feature should reject uh, much more spurs, but you can also bypass it and look at the sweet speed. You can also play a little bit with the resolution bandwidth in there, for example. So in there you have the resolution bandwidth and with the resolution bandwidth, you can also try to, to have like a, maybe a better speed. Uh, so just tweaking those two things allows you to increase a little bit the sweet speed in there. It is like having like a 500 kilohertz or 200 kilohertz per second is good for having like a high sweet speed but also as said before i mean 400 giga gigahertz is enough uh, with the spur rejection feature working in standard so you have to know also that we are using a sweep this is just a feature that allows us to spot some frequency around so if the sweet speed is not fast enough this is not a problem i mean you can still use maximum hold then go to the toilet and then you come back and then you will see something happening in the frequency at some time. It's true that if you have a, a communication that is very short to spot and that you cannot spot every time here, I mean, a very high sweet speed uh, would be required. But yeah, as you can see, 400 gigahertz is enough. Still, also for that, 
as I said before, for this range, you need a special antenna or a switch that you can program. It should be also mentioned that uh, this SA is capable of doing the DSP inside the FPGA. So uh, basically, for example, for the FFT execution, if you want, for example, to tweak this value, I mean, this is one of the features you can tweak, but maybe later on this software, you can tweak all the values in order to be executed or not in the FPGA or in the CPU. But for example, in the sweep mode, you can choose, for example, to do the FFT execution using the FPGA. I mean, here I'm, I'm using the automatic execution, so normally it will prefer uh, the FPGA, but I can also use the CPU only like that in high resolution. So let's see. Up, we see that now the usage of the CPU is increasing in there. So yeah, basically it has an impact, but yeah, for the moment we just have uh, processing that is actually made on the CPU with the software. But maybe later uh, you will be able to do that on the GPU, maybe. Let's see. I mean, this software is pretty new at the end. So let's maybe show also a frequency. So for example, if we're interested about another frequency like that, we can maybe zoom on that if we want like that. So here we can also maybe just like make a waterfall happening and wait a little bit to see if something else is happening. So yeah, there's like something happening in there, but yeah, also it's the signal is pretty weak in there. Maybe we don't have like a lot of signals. Let's maybe focus on some other frequency. I would probably have like other frequency in mind. Uh, I would maybe show that on, the, on another mode. Uh, about modes, yeah, you have also some measures tabs that you can use. So for example, you have the EMM3, phase noise, channel power, ACPR. I mean, yeah, a lot of features that are missing in there, of course, comparing to Spike software, but still, I mean, you have the insertion. So yeah, basically, for example, if you want to measure like, for example, the power of one channel, I mean, we can maybe specify one channel in particular like that and we can maybe measure it like that. I mean, it's cool. We can also do that that way. We can maybe use another channel if we want to use another channel like that. But yeah, it's pretty basic at the end, as you can see. Um, this is like also a data feature which allows us, for example, to record something. So if we want to record what is happening right now, we can do that and we can then replay it like that. You can also loop on it uh, if you want. So yeah, basically, yeah. As you can see, there's like some basic uh, features in there. What is what is cool with this software is that you have, you know, you have the social at the end. You have the sweep mode like that. You have other modes that I will also show you. But yeah, I mean, if you want to go further, I will show you how you can do that. So if we want to also analyze what is going on, so let's maybe just like up, close that and go maybe on this channel, which looks like something interesting. So I can maybe just put a marker on that and see that, for example, I'm dealing with a channel at 2.4. 33 like that. So let's maybe just copy this frequency and go to another mode. So I have another mode that I will explain, which is the IQ streaming mode. And this is something that we'll also we will use to decode some signal. But let's see the real time spectrum RTA mode. So being on the RTA uh, mode, we can look at some frequency in real time this time. So let's copy now the frequency in there like that. And here we see that we are not well centered, as you can see in there. So if we want to be like well centered, we should go to this frequency instead. Up, like that, perfect. And yeah, have a better uh, idea of, I mean, to be really well centered, we should actually go in this frequency. So this frequency is related to channel six on the Wi-Fi 2.4 gigahertz. But compared to another software that uh, I like about this, is that uh, it's very difficult to actually uh, see uh, which channel are we actually uh, working with. So let's maybe just see another software which could be very interesting for Hyrologic to know because I think that if Hyrologic implements the feature that I will show you, I mean, this software will have also another killing feature. So I will just like launch another software that is called RTSA Pro, like that. Oh. So I'm launching RTSA Pro like that and then I will go exactly on the same frequency as before, talking about the same thing. And what I really like with the, of course, the colors are beautiful compared to a Hyrogic. I mean, Hyrogic is probably less sexy, but also something that is very good with the software is that we have the some frequency profile feature. I mean, for example, if you want to do like some, if you want to display some signal in the air and you want to have like a better idea of how the signal can be categorized uh, in terms of frequency bands, 
I mean, there's like a nice uh, frequency plan that can be used, for example, for Wi-Fi 2.4 gigahertz, close, and then you can go in there and you can actually just like spot one frequency like that, like this one. And you can see that this frequency is actually uh, related to channel six uh, on the Wi-Fi 2.4 2 gigahertz, which is cool. I mean, uh, also, RTA Pro in terms of isolation is actually very good. Uh, they, I mean, they work uh, a lot on this to make this very nice to see. But using, for example, an easier, uh, an easier uh, way of putting all the blocks, of using all the features, it can be very flexible as very, very complex at the end, much more complex than using GNU Radio. Uh, and also, uh, at the end, you are less flexible than GNU Radio. So, so now if we just like try to compare that to the Spike software, the Spike software looks not exactly the same, uh, but it is much more like a test and measurement uh, software. So yeah, there's like still the sweep feature in there. And as I'm using the BB6TD, I don't have the same sweep speed as the SM and uh, exactly as the Arogic SA200 uh, and also the Spectrum V6. But yeah, I mean, still, you can also spot a lot of stuff with this uh, sweep speed even if it's not very reactive. So let's go back to the real time in there and we can maybe now use the same frequencies uh, we have used previously, like the 2.4 gigahertz, like that. And we can actually see a channel that, that looks like that. That's perfect. Now we are focusing on one good channel in there. You'll probably notice that, uh, yeah, I will probably use also uh, clear white. Uh, yeah, let's maybe use a peak in there. I can maybe just use a delta. And we can also have a raw idea of the difference between the noise flow that we see in there and the channel. So like that, we see that, for example, in clear white, uh, I mean, I would probably just like use average. Average would be better uh, in a sense. I would probably just use another delta up like that. So yeah, here we see that we have basically like 20 dB difference in there on the average. So if we use exactly the same things as in there, we can use up 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 like that we'll use the trace now on the average in there yeah on the average it's probably not the best thing in there i probably just like also use clear white like that we have 20 db difference in there and we have 20 different 20 db difference in there so we can also increase a little bit that for example using another resolution in there so if we increase the reference level so we see that we have been able to increase it. Wait a second, I will also just use up another data in here. So we can actually see the difference using the Alta bandwidth. Uh, compared to, the, to Spike and compared to BB6TD, the, uh, the real time spectrum cannot use a resolution bandwidth lower than that using uh, this decimate effector. We should actually decimate first before using a lesser resolution bandwidth, which is kind of a pity because, I mean, for example, with the Spike software, we can actually set up that even if the span is high or not. I mean, for example, if we just like increase a little bit the span like that and we uh, we want a resolution bandwidth lower than that, I mean, we can actually do that, for example, which is cool. Uh, but with Arrowjig, for example, we need to decimate in order to use a resolution bandwidth that is lower. So yeah, I mean, there's like probably like a lot of problematics also to to resolve also to to be able to use a resolution bandwidth which is very i mean low i mean for the f uh, filter but yeah um still uh this is something that's uh that is probably better with the bb6td and the spike software uh because i mean with the bb6td we can have a very low resolution bandwidth uh, for a span of 27 megahertz which is not the same in here. In, in here, I mean, we don't have the choice but to to use a resolution bandwidth which is at 14 kilohertz and not 2.446 kilohertz uh, rather, mostly. So, yeah, uh, if we want, for example, to have like, um, I mean, to increase also the, the sensitivity of uh, the signal that we are uh, looking at, uh, it's, it will be better to use, for example, the BB60D. But yeah, these settings uh, actually are, are very good to have uh, because this is something that you don't have, for example, with the RTC Pro. On the RTC Pro, for example, with Aronia, you don't have the choice 
but you uh, you use only the span and the frequency in use. So for example, we can use the frequency in there, up, in there like that, up. Then you don't have, I mean, unless I'm mistaken, I'm also probably mistaken, but I didn't saw any way of, for example, tweaking a little bit the, uh, the resolution bandwidth and the video bandwidth, uh, exactly like most of the spectrum analyzer. So sometimes you want also to be able to tweak a little bit more the resolution bandwidth as well as the video bandwidth and so on. Uh, so this is something that is probably missing on that TSC Pro uh, and should be actually put also in that TSC Pro. But yeah, mostly as I saw, I mean, as I show you, uh, for example, in Spike software, you don't have the band plan on the Harrogic, you don't have also the band plan. So the band plan is actually a feature which makes RTC Pro, uh, I mean, good for visualization, for example. So yeah, if Harrogic and Spikes just integrate the band plan, we will have maybe like a very good feature. If we have a way to to create our own band plan and as well show it to the um, to um, I mean, to the uh, different modes, it would be like you know uh, perfect at the end. So Spike for me is like maybe the best software for example to do measurement because you can also decode for example some signal. So let's say that you want to decode some uh, very easy uh, demodulation. I mean modulation. Like you want to uh, decode for example some stuff like that. Like for example, if I have like some signal in there, uh, two pole, two megahertz like that, and I want to get decode it. I, I can actually decode for example. You can actually see. I mean the difference. You can see the preamble just like going there. Like that with the one one zero one zero run i mean very quickly but you can also demodulate a little bit things uh so for example you can do like digital demodulation and uh, for example you can see the different symbol table in there i mean you should also select for example which uh which kind of modulation it is so as it is you to fsk you should see something that looks as follows at the end so symbol table looks at, like that then you can export it for example if you want i mean that's that's what I like with the software. You have different type of analysis tools, like you have also VLAN tools, LTE mapping. Uh, you can also do exactly the same things like phase noise also, scalar network analysis. I mean, there's like EMC pre-compliance also, modules. You have a lot of modules in there. And then you can, exactly the same way I will do with Harrogic. Uh, you can use the IQ, the output of the IQ analysis. Uh, you can also use the API of, uh, of uh, CNLHound in order to get the, the IQ stream and analyze it with U-Tool exactly. With Arrowgic, you have exactly the same thing, but I will talk about it a bit later. So now let's see about some uh, some sort of things we can do with the Arrowgic. So let's maybe just like look at the uh, IQ streaming mode. So uh, I will first maybe just like show, I mean, an interesting channel on 2.4 megahertz like that. On 2.4 megahertz, I can see a nice channel that is uh, kind of, you know, uh, I mean, very high compared to the, uh, to the overs. I'll probably just like use the preset in order to erase all the things that I've done. So like that, I don't have to tweak everything. So now with 100 megahertz uh, bandwidth, I can, uh, I can actually see two channels. But if I'm using, for example, the decimator factor like that, and also I'm just like trying to decrease a little bit the real time bandwidth, at the end, I will see also some something else. And I will also lower down the reference level so you will be able also to see to the other channel. So now let's zoom a little bit on that and let's see what we got. So yeah, I would just like zoom like that. I would just like decrease as much as possible as I can the real time, I mean the resolution bandwidth and see, we can actually see different channels. So there's like one channel in there. There's one channel in there that is very close to this one and here, that must be like one of a channel, but we don't see it properly. So this is something that uh, actually uh, uh, sometimes is missing. I mean, maybe, yeah, with this reference level, we can actually see that more properly, but yeah, still this channel is not obvious. So we, so we see that there's like one channel, which is, which is kind of higher right now by tweaking a little bit the uh, reference level. I will also maybe use the decimeter factor in order to also adjust a little bit more the uh, resolution bandwidth and we have a better sensitivity for the channel we are looking at as well as the other channels as well. So like that, yeah, we can clearly see that there's like one channel, but that is very low compared to this one. But yeah, so this one is a channel which is very, um, it's coming from an antenna which is very close to my place. Um, 
if I want to spot it with the spike software, I will use first of all the same frequency as before like that. And then I will use now the span. I will reduce the span a bit like that. I will also maybe just like put the persistence so that I can also see what is going on. Uh, and now we'll also set up a little bit more. I will try to exactly, let's maybe just like preset or like that. Uh, up, because I messed a little bit with this software. Up, like that. Perfect. So let's just like up, reduce the span. I will increase the level like that. I will probably just like up. Use this pan. Let's now see the resolution bandwidth can be very low compared to our logic in there, as you can see. Uh, so for our logic, I needed to be like at 32 decimeter factor in there. But for example, with the uh, with the um, the Spike software, I can have like 27 megahertz uh, span and a resolution bandwidth of 2.4 kilohertz, which is, I mean, better for the frequency I'm looking at. So now let's just like increase a little bit more that and yeah, I uh, would probably just like in here. We should also see a channel, but this is also not very obvious. As you can see at the end, up, we can a little bit compare all of that. I mean, 80, 86. Okay, so let's maybe just like, up, sorry, increase a little bit the span like that. Oh, sorry, up, like that. I will just like increase a little bit the span. So like that, we we'll have exactly the same up pretty the same configuration at the end i'm trying to find a way to to observe that up or just like maybe put that that way so, yeah so we can we can see that we are pretty the same uh things in there uh pretty because uh i mean i will try to also hide that okay so let's maybe do like some comparison in there directly so what we can see we can see the frequency of interest which looks in there it's better generally to use iq to compare all of that but yeah first i wanted to show you with the software the different things that you can see so basically we have pretty the same result but in there as you can see in there yeah i'm also i will try to use also maybe and like the same configuration also we have we are at three kilohertz like that so I will put three kilohertz in there up like that okay in order to have the same configuration but because uh, as you can see in there with spike i can have like a better better resolution but uh, with our logic i'm a little bit limited uh, so i will try to use exactly the same configuration so like that we can also maybe spot some signal that, yeah. Here you can see, for example, um, there's like one channel that is a little bit. M is it missing or ah? Yeah, maybe not. Wait a second. I will also go to this frequency, nine nine, and here we have delta. I will not use delta nine. Okay, so it's not missing. It's just like a problem of display in there. So yeah, uh, I will probably just like do a second video measuring and also comparing the iqs because it is not very obvious in there i will try to also to match exactly the same frequency ah, yeah. i was not using the same frequency in there so wait a second up i will exactly use the same i will begin at up 96 96.84 Nine six eight four like that, and I will stop at nine nine point ninety six. All right, and at least we should have exactly the same span in there. Okay, so yeah, now it's better. Now it's better, we can actually see that we have kind of like the same result at the end. Of course, you will probably notice that the noise flow is a little bit lower with the with the BB6D, which is normal because the BB6D is also a very good SA at the end. The difference we can also observe in there is the this noise the noise flow. The noise flow is uh 10 dB. I mean we have a 10 dB difference. Uh, and actually the 
The BB60 is actually winning the game. I mean, we are only seeing that with the software, uh, of course. Uh, we can also like maybe compare a little bit the the spike in there. Like for example, just uh, create some pairs. We can use for example that and compare for example this spike in there. So we have like in here in here uh, 30 dB difference approximately in there. Here, up. If we use the delta up like that, what we have is also 30 dB, I mean 40 dB, like that. So kind of like the same at the end. So yeah, I mean, I think that the best will be like to, to maybe compare the IQ to IQ and also with a generator. Uh, but yeah, as you can see, I mean, we don't miss anything. I mean, for this uh, frequency, of course, I mean, probably with other frequency, I can maybe just like try to compare it on some uh, frequency like uh, 4, 2, 3, 19, 2 megahertz. I mean, both will see something, but yeah, doesn't matter. Uh, I just want to show you that, I mean, at the end, we have kind of like the same things. So yeah, we have also to shift this frequency a bit later, like that. So yeah, now if we compare, for example, that and that, for example, you can see there's like a nice 2 FSK signal that is displaying in there. So yeah. At the end, the results are pretty, pretty the same. I mean, even if the, the BB60D has better ADC than the, the Arrogic one, what is missing with Arrogic is some tools exactly like with Spike to do some measures. So like that, you have a cheap, compact, and also uh, a test and measurement essay that you can use for a lot of purposes. But yeah, I mean, still you can extend uh, the possibilities. I will show you that we can use the API or we can use also the IQ in order to go forward if we want. So we introduced another essay in the loop. I mean, I already introduced it, but I wanted also to show you the difference uh, with the software we've seen previously and also the all-in-one standalone uh, device that you can see in there. It was actually an SDR because it is using a pretty the same architecture as the Blade RF, if I recall correctly, uh, but they made a lot of work to make it very sensitive to avoid a lot of reflection and also isolate it properly. So yeah, I mean, DeepPace made, made a lot of work around this device and made this device pretty accurate to and you can actually use it as a spectrum analyzer still. I mean, it is not using the same spectrum analyzer architecture as the BB60D and the SAE 200 and others that are much more expensive, but it's very sensitive at the end. Yeah, if you want to decode, for example, some data, so let's say that you want, for example, to decode the FM, uh, we can go uh, now on the end. Maybe we can just like sweep a little bit on the on the on that. I will just like press set. And I will center it to, uh, to 100 megahertz like that. So like that, we can also take in account, uh, we, I'll use a span, a bit lower span like this one. We can have a nice peak in there. So it's kind of funny because uh, uh, in here, particularly in this building, uh, this building is kind of acting like a Faraday cage in here. Uh, but yeah, the funny fact is that as I'm very close to one specific antenna, one FM antenna, um, I have a very strong signal uh, among the others that are very low. Uh, but we'll be able to see with another device, like for example the QC908, which is very sensible, that our channels are present around. But here, it's difficult to say if we have some noise or some channels. So yeah, if we want, to, for example, to listen to this radio, we can, we can go to the IQ streaming mode, for example, and we can go to the uh, frequency that was displayed uh, before and so like that we can spot this peak in here which is still displayed and over uh, you have other moves that like moves related to radio right uh, but here you clearly have some channel i mean you have also another channel uh, so for example uh, i will also create another marker so up marker one or with marker two open so i can create another marker which actually indicates also another frequency another channel in there yeah but if i want to focus on this one which is clearly uh, very strong uh, because also the antenna is very very <laughs> close i can actually uh, go in there you can also see that in the bottom of the, the fft 
um, you can actually also see the IQ data uh, that is displayed in time. So it is exactly related, uh, related to the time sync, for example, in GNU Radio. Uh, so you can see the IQ data in there, and you can, for example, just like auto arrange a little bit more to see what is happening there. So for the moment, as we are scanning like a very large bandwidth, uh, we'll not be able to see something very uh, you know, useful. But if we use a decimator in there, particularly, um, the problem is that in IQ stream mode, so in real stream mode, we are actually uh, uh, stuck. Uh, we cannot use a sample rate which is lower than 110 megasample per second. So in there, if we want to focus on our signal which is in there, we need to use the decimator factor. Maybe it's like an improvement, a further, I mean, a future improvement for our logic, but yeah. Uh, for now, it's a little bit of a limitation. And this limitation also exists in Spectrum V6, for example. So if you own a Spectrum V6, you will have exactly the same limitation. So we have to use the decimator in order to focus a little bit more on the channel. So like that, for example, you can see for example, that we are facing some sort of an FSK, uh, I mean, not FSK, but FM uh, modulation in there with some noise um, as well. So uh, probably also using some filter will also help a bit. But yeah, uh, if you want to demodulate it, there's like another feature that you know is not shown, for example, in there. But you can actually just right click on the accurate data, create a signal, and then listen to the radio. But if you want to listen to this uh, signal, uh, as I said before, you need to go out of the continue mode. Because continue mode just sends some frames, but not all the frames to have the real data. So if you want to have the real data, you have to go to the stream mode, exactly. And then you can listen to radio. So basically, this is very useful because like that, you have a way, for example, to listen to the, your favorite, favorite channels, for example. So of course, you need to capture the right frequency because if you just like use a lower decimator, you will have a lot of noise. But yeah, uh, still, it's some nice feature you can get. And you have another type of demodulator, which is the AM. So it's pretty basic, but yeah, uh, still uh, so, and some kind of useful. Also in this mode, you can, uh, as usual, use a waterfall if you want. So also you can display the waterfall uh, in IQ um, spectrum mode in there. So very handy. Now let's take a look at the same feature, but using an FSK signal, for example. I can go back, for example, to the sweep mode, for example. I can go like to the presets, see that there's like a signal that is very strong in there. I can just like maybe locate it and say, hey, let's maybe look at the all 32 megahertz. So I will go to the IQ streaming mode in there. I will also go to presets up. I will go to the 432 megahertz and say, and also see that up, ah, up, the signal is actually shown at really at 433.95 MHz. So I will just like adjust a little bit things a bit further, be more precise. And then I will try to narrow down a little bit the decimeter because here I'm stuck with the sample rate of 122 in here. So I will just like narrow down a little bit things and look at it. So yeah, I can, we can actually now spot a 2FSK signal. And so this 2FSK signal is at 433.92 megahertz. So we can go to the right frequency like that. We can also adjust a little bit the reference level so like that you can see the noise and also the, the signal. And then we can also just like auto arrange things to see that we are facing, it's not obvious to see that we are facing an FSK modulation, but yeah, uh, I mean, on the FFT, it is obvious. So then if we want to decode it, I mean, exactly the same way, uh, we can, for example, just like, sorry, we can use the AFM demodulator. And so like that, we can also spot uh, in the different, uh, the different bits in here. It's kind of uh, speedy. So if you want, for example, to analyze the data thereafter, uh, yeah, you don't have the choice, but to uh, do like some record, right? So if you want to record this signal, you can do that. Uh, we can actually, for example, up. You can just like see that with the demodulation we have like some data like that, but we will not use that for the record. For the record, we'll use the data tab 
And then we go to uh, the rectified path. So the rectified path looks in here like that. So I will just like start a record, but you can see that it stopped already. So I have to just increase the number of points like that. And then I can start the record. I can stop the record then. And after that, if I want to analyze that, I will have to do some work at the end. And yes, sometimes we have to work a little bit uh, because as, um, I mean, uh, unlike, for example, the signal hounds uh, interface, GUI, and the spectrum analyzer that has maybe, I don't know if the spectrum analyzer has a block for that, but could have. Uh, but on our logic, you don't have the feature to decode the data. It's not a problem. We can do that uh, manually with the capture. So we'll use the capture against uh, GNU Radio so like that we can also see what is happening. So let's see how we can actually do that. Um, I can go back now in there. I can now just maybe just reduce it, uh, spot the, uh, I will spot the data. So this is this capture, right? So I would just like now launch one, one tool like GNU Radio could be like another tool because here you have a WAV file. But the WAV file, I mean, if you look at the WAV file, you have to take an account that this WAV file is using also two tracks. If you want, for example, to see that, and it's obvious when looking at this, you can actually see that, for example, this, uh, how to say, it's uh, up like that. So it is exactly up this one. I don't know. Ah, yeah, I have like, a, okay. I have like a, this one. I have actually two two signals that were generated. So yeah, it's not obvious to see that, but uh, also yeah, if you try to just like try to select some range in here, you see that there's like a little shift. Uh, it's not obvious that you see like a shift of uh, 90 degree because this, I mean, the level is pretty low, but I mean, you have to take an account that there's like two tracks. So as there's two tracks, the things that you need to do is for example, just like uh, tracks wave uh, IQ. I uh, would just like title uh, the project like that. You have to take an account also the uh, sampling rate, which is in use. So basically I can take it from the, the WAV file, uh, uh, I mean the WAV file format, but I can uh, directly also look at the sample uh, rate that is in use for the recording. I mean, uh, thanks to the modulation and the, to, uh, thanks to the decimation and the sample rate in use. Um, by decimating the sample rate to the decimator factor of 256, I'm able to have a sample rate of 490 kilohertz. And so like that, we can just say, hey, we have a 400 kilohertz sample rate, right? So now we can use the Wi-Fi source like that. Up, we can specify uh, the, uh, I will probably just like download plus data, data like that. It was this one, if I'm correct. Yeah, looks like this one. So now I have also to set up two channels in there. And then I can see what is going on. So uh, I will actually convert it to complex like that up directly. So here's how I can extend also the capabilities if I want to inspect uh, the, the data, for example. Uh, I mean, you can also use uh, URH directly, but yeah, if you want, for example, to just like first look at um, what is going on, for example, in there, uh, precisely, you can use, for example, the QTG range. Um, so wave, tracks, uh, IQ, up. So you can see what is going on. Uh, so yeah, that's, if you want to extend, for example, the tools, I mean, um, uh, with this example, I have exactly the same tools as for our logic. But then if I want, for example, to just like look, yeah, and I don't remember, but I didn't saw the constellation also feature. You can also look at the constellation to figure out if you are facing a PSK signal or any uh, phase shifting uh, uh, um, type of modulation. Then if you figure out that you are facing a 2FSK signal, you can use, for example, directly the Quelcher demote like that. I mean, now I'm not using any filter. I, um, I also forgot to maybe look at the deviation. Wait a second. So the deviation, I mean, you have like, a, okay, let's say like 20 kilohertz deviation. I mean, I'm just doing that very quickly. Up, I don't want to to bore you, but uh, 20 kilohertz deviation like that. Up, up, enable, uh, then up, and then up. And so then you have something that looks as follows. Then I mean you can use, for example, let's say a threshold, for example, if you want uh, the threshold. If I remember, 
the values from the link was minus three. I mean, uh, three like that. And then you can have like some clear uh, one and uh, zero uh, values like that. I mean, then you can use, I mean, uh, a sync, uh, a symbol sync block in order to extract the symbols depending on the sample rates. So like that, you can just like take all the one and zeros like that and then output them to a byte file. I mean, there's like a video showing you that in my channel. I will not go through that. But yeah, here is how we can extend. Because as I said, the features are very basic, but very essential. So as you could see in here, uh, of course, it is basic, but you have all the essential tools at the end to do like some primary measures and then to take some captures and then you can evaluate your captures with your tool. So doing a capture is a thing, but there's also another way. Of course. Also, our object gives you a nice API programming grid, which gives you all the abilities, which is kind of great. You have instructions, for example, to uh, use the sweep mode, uh, how to actually also use the uh, IQ streaming mode, etc. So I think that Arogic made this uh, API in order to extend it because uh, they, I mean, they knew that the uh, the GUI was kind of basic. If you want to go further, like me, for example, to do like some special uh, processing. I mean, you want maybe to use the API at some point. So I will probably show you that a bit later uh, because I didn't have the time also to tweak around this. It's but very good because you are not only stuck with the only uh, software. Exactly like Spectra, Aronia Spectrum Analyzer, you have the ability also to extend it because uh, now they did an SDK uh, where you can develop tools around it. It's pretty easy compared to Arogic because Arogic, as you can see, it's like just like one DLL specific to our logic and the other, the others are specific, for example, to do like some FFT stuff, etc. So, I mean, uh, you can make your own uh, tools around it. Kind of great that you are not stuck only with the software. But yeah, still, you know, the difference that you can find between all these devices can be the software. Some of the software are much more advanced than the others. If you want to travel, if you're traveling a lot and you want to test it, for example, with a very tiny computer like this one, the GPD micro PC, you can do that. I mean, uh, I mean, the combination of micro PC and uh, the Arogic is amazing. Uh, Arogic also made the, the software to be like very, very low in time of uh, computing. So like that, it fits perfectly on the micro PC without any issue. And also with the screen, it's practical. Um, and I will show you that. Uh, I was like kind of amazed because of, uh, for, I first you know, uh, if you try, for example, to use uh, RTSA Pro from Aronia on the micro PC, it will be a little bit laggy. But with the SAS Studio 4, I mean, there's like no problem to run it. So it's kind of great because, you know, you can take like I mean, a device which is which does not have like a lot of computing uh, speed, but uh, is very tiny, like this one. I mean, just six inches. And then you can put it in a simple bag. Now, when I meant a simple bag, I meant this one, for example. I mean, you can, for example, just like put your, uh, I mean, micro PC from GPD in there, like that. And then, wait a second, up. Same thing from our logic for our logic. You can just, because I, I need to unplug it a bit in there, you can put, I mean, our logic in the bag, pretty easy. And it fits in this bag. So at the end, it looks like that. Perfect, right? And if you don't trust me, I will show you that running on the micro PC like that. So here is the micro PC in there. I will launch now the software like that directly. And I mean, you will see. So we can use the sweep if we want. We can also just use a remote in order to display a little. As you can see, it's also pretty reactive, right? And much more important than that, we can do like, we can go to mode, IQ remote. We can go to 433 megahertz. Again, 
like that with this remote and we can see our remote in there then we can set up the bandwidth if we want so let's just like set up the bandwidth up decimate a bit like that by decimation yeah i also figure out that we should actually go a little bit up like that that so now we are perfectly centered we can but now we continue so then we can just like make it auto range like that perfect and if you want to you, you can actually use also the demodulator like that and it looks like that at the end. i can maybe show you that also I mean, on you know, on a, big, a better picture so like that, you may actually see it running. So now we are displaying what the micro PC is doing. So for example, you can retrieve the sample data. You may also see, for example, the truck puts in there. I mean, as you can see, this software is running without any issue and also i may probably show you also the specs of the micro pc so like that you can also figure out for example for you what could be like a right setup uh, with this device so here i'm using like an intel celeron and so it's a n4 100 cpu 1.10 gigahertz so uh, basically it's a 64 bits it's I mean, it's a decent setup. So what we can say about Harrogic? Um, it is a nice, compact device, cheap. Okay, the software is not you know, very, very featured as was both Spike and also uh, RTSA Pro. But I mean, we have everything that is essential for the price. So yeah, uh, what we can say is that still we can extend it with the API, which is great because with the API, we can actually pl I mean, plug it in our tools. Uh, but yeah, if you want, for example, an hardware which is very sensitive, which has a very good dynamic range and uh, is very good for test and measurements for a nice price like 20, uh, um, 20k euro. Uh, yeah, you can actually find maybe the SM version, for example, of uh, Signal Hound. But if you have much more budget, I would recommend maybe going to uh, Rodeo Schwartz, uh, Keysight, Agilent, etc. Tektronix as well where, I mean, generally, you will not ask questions about, uh, I mean, if it works or not for your purpose, because generally it will. For very low budget, you should actually consider Harrogic, which is actually winning the game of having a very, you know, low price device, compact. I mean, to still, as I said, the tool are, you know, not very feature, but I mean, doesn't matter. You can put it and plug it on your tools using the API or using the IQ that is coming out of the, 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 the SaaS Studio software. Uh, even if the uh, BB60D is not as powerful as Harrogic, it is much more sensitive, has a better resolution. But Harrogic is actually proposing a device which is capable of doing like a 9 kHz to 20 GHz at a switch speed of uh, much more than 400 gigahertz per second. What can we ask? And this is the end of this video. I hope you like it. Don't this day to comment out, subscribe, and also to thumbs up. And uh, in the second part, I will try my best in order to show you the difference, uh, I mean, to compare these devices against the generators or like that, it will be much more precise, also on the raw IQ. And so I think it will be complex. But yeah, until then, stay safe and see you later. Thank you. Bye bye.